Thanks very much, Ed. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning. It's great to see David Cameron. People often say to, about people who are behind the scenes that you've played a role or you've spearheaded a, a victory or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, it's the people who put their names on the ballot papers who are prepared to be judged by their peers who are the people that should be acknowledged for what they're prepared to do. And so I acknowledge the great contribution David Cameron has made to the United Kingdom. Hopefully it's not over yet, David. Um, and hopefully we can understand uh, a little later today, once we look at some of the numbers, the impact uh, of voters' views about what's happening to their lives in that outcome that surprised so many in relation to Brexit. Listening to Ed uh, in, do the introduction and talk about the KFC crisis, and it was described as a crisis in the United Kingdom, not only in the tweet you saw up there, I was reminded that in the last six months, there have been 140 individual stories, individual subject stories, in the BBC online using the word crisis. 140 different crises in the United Kingdom, including the failure to distribute Kentucky Fried Chicken as quickly as people might like. We've heard from that excellent outline from Ed and from the other speeches already made about the concern that exists about division in society, that people seem to be getting angrier, that the world as we knew it doesn't seem to work as it used to, that people who aspire to a better life don't seem always to be able to achieve those outcomes. But I'm going to show you uh, in some data that I'm presenting that in fact I think this is very much a Western democracy problem. Of course every society has issues, but many of the things that the commentators are talking about, the sort of not quite hysteria, but certainly increasing concern about what people talk about as you know, the decline in our society, anger and frustration, what's going on. It's very much centred on what's happening in the more developed countries, much less the developing countries. And, and to give you a sense of a lack of understanding, I think, of, of polarisation versus controversy versus other things, I saw in the media recently that people were saying that you only have to look at what's going on with, in uh, the United States, Donald Trump, uh, in India, Modi, uh, in uh, the Philippines, Duterte, to, to see that there's a real polarisation taking place. But that doesn't really tell the whole story. Modi has an 88% approval within his own community. Duterte, as you can see from these numbers, is a 79% approval. Donald Trump, 34% uh, uh, approval and probably are going a little lower. So you can say they're controversial, you can say perhaps they're populist, but it's not necessarily true that they are polarising. In some parts of the West, there's a real sense that things are getting better, uh, getting worse than better. This sentiment, though, is not shared in large parts of the so-called developing world. And as you can see, we did a poll in 2016. We repeated, we're repeating it later this year, but our company did a poll to look at the attitude of people in various countries. And you can see there, 74% of people in India, 75% of people in the Philippines, in Indonesia, 78% of people in the Philippines all thought their country was heading in the right direction. At the same time, only 29% of people in the USA thought so, and in the UK, 32%. And when asked, do you think your children will be better off financially than you, in India, 76% said they thought their children would be better off. In Indonesia, 61%. In the Philippines, 61%. But then look at the USA and the UK, 37 and 24%, and... Uh, Lowest of all, and President Sarkozy may have a view about this, France at 9%. So there is a different view about what's happening in their worlds for different citizens in different parts of the world. And we should never lose sight of that. And we shouldn't, no one should display a sort of Western arrogance that what's going on in our countries means the whole world is going in this direction. But it is true that the Western democracies are becoming more polarised, with age and economic fortune being key dividing lines. 
For example, when asked, is immigration a burden on the country? In 1994 in the UK, there was a 25 point gap between supporters of Labor and the Conservatives. By 2014, that gap had grown to 33 points. At the UK general election, Labor beat the Conservatives by 52 points amongst 18 to 24 year olds, 52 points. But the Conservatives beat Labor by 29% amongst people over 65. So you're seeing a very significant polarisation based on age. And when you ask people about their view of society, is it broken? You can see very significant differences between the USA and the UK and France, as you see here, 66, 60, 56 and 52% on the one hand, and India, for example, on the other at 32%. So you're seeing polarisation by age, you're seeing polarisation by country, uh, and we need to understand why this is happening. Well, the first thing I, th I think, and when you look at, look at evidence of this, you find that the rise of social media has, seems to have shifted from a very positive attribute that many people early on thought would be a great force for good to become an echo chamber for anger. Only 14% of British adults believe that social media will ultimately be good for society. Only 14%. That means 86% of people think that social, in the United Kingdom think that social media uh, will be not ultimately good for society. My mother used to say to me, when you're thinking bad things, bite your tongue. Don't say anything. Social media has enabled people not to bite their tongue, but reach for the keyboard. And so there's a sense that the trolling, the cyberbullying, the extremism that's expressed is made all too easy and there seems limited, according to the voters, accountability in relation to that. But also you have the issue of the traditional media. Traditional media today, 24 hours, 24 hour news cycles, fractured, desperate for content, desperate to be noticed. So they do, even the erstwhile BBC, they do throw around, around words like crisis and scandal in a way they once didn't. They are grappling for attention, they have to elevate stories, they're looking for content, they need uh, more information. And for print newspapers that are like wildebeests uh, in a drought scurrying over an ever-diminishing pool of water, the need to try to stop that decline in circulation and, and get that attention to keep the advertising revenues up and provide links to their uh, online material, that gets ever increasingly uh, challenging and I think leads them to more extreme coverage of the way they do with, when they deal with issues. But there's also, as been said already by at least two of the contributors, there does seem to be a loss of faith in institutions and a loss of confidence in the economic and social promise of globalisation and technology. Any trust indicator one looks at shows, a, and Ed displayed countries, but you can display individuals and institutions as well, you will see constant declines over recent years in the West in relation to institutions on which people once, came, once relied and in whom they placed great faith whether it be religious institutions, financial institutions, political institutions, the media, a whole range of institutions that were once the bedrock uh, of trust and foundation for progress are now challenged uh, by, by, by the community. And when you look at events like Brexit and others, you find that the people who swung the vote are people who feel that the system's not working for them. They are economic, they feel they're going backwards economically, that they no longer can, the, the, the simple uh, process that you could work hard, play by the rules, better your life and deliver something better for your children, doesn't seem to be working for them and they're angry. And then finally, and I think this is something overlooked but I think it's very important, uh, and I can say this because I have advised uh, political campaigns over a long time, I think the professionalism of politics uh, causes issues too. 
Because what you advise a political candidate when they're running is that to get elected, you've got to control the agenda. You've got to make sure it's on your terms. And you also advise them that you've got to differentiate from your opponent. Because if you don't differentiate, what's the point in changing? So this focus on differentiation and, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, division, polarisation, is, is a risk with the way campaigns are conducted. And then, of course, if you want to control the agenda, sometimes you have to say extreme or colourful things to get attention. I call it dropping a dead cat on the table. If the agenda is going in a direction you want, uh, you don't want, if a something's going in the direction you don't want and you want to grab attention, you get a dead cat and you stick it on the table and guess what everybody does? They start talking about the dead cat. The master of this is currently presiding in the White House. <laughs> when you want to change the agenda, get a dead cat, put it on the table, this smelly, furry, bleeding thing is there, I've got nothing against cats I must say, um, <laughs> is sitting there and everybody's attention is changed. And that's a deliberate strategy. It's about controlling the agenda. So as people have become more professionally astute at politics, if I can put it that way, I think it exposes with it risks as well. Um, what can we do? We need to change the media discourse. We need to connect with people in relation to their values, what drives them, what matters to them. We need to deliver unifying economic progress and we need leaders who are dealers in hope, who give people a sense of optimism about what the future can bring. Thank you. Linton, thank you for that. Um, so we've got time for some questions, I'm pleased to say. You, you set out in your remarks there that the polarisation effect is circumstantial, it's situational, and it's primarily affecting advanced, developed economies. To what extent do you think that it's essentially, this is an ine a inevitable phenomenon, that in the end all countries will experience that? And if that is the case, what are the lessons for countries that aren't experiencing this kind of polarisation effect at the moment? Well, the first thing I should say, of course, is that I've dealt with the political and economic dimension. There are other elements of polarisation and division across communities that uh, uh, go much deeper and have uh, much more entrenched and historical aspects to them, and they represent great challenge to the world as well. Mm -hmm. But in relation to, you know, this has happened to advanced development economies, what about developing economies, will they catch up with yeah. the same sentiment? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, learn the lessons, see how things are conducted, uh, see how, what's happening now, and give attention uh, to the way economic progress brings, uh, particularly as it becomes more advanced. You use those statistics that showed, you know, the decline in deaths of young people, of children, of mm. babies, and all of those things. You know, there's great progress being made. That's important, and you need pro economic progress and other pro medical and other progress to ensure they happen. But be alert to the way you conduct politics. Be alert to the feeling of disaffection that people have and ensure that people feel that they have a stake in society. It's when they feel that they're trying to do the right thing but others who don't seem to do the right thing or just aren't putting in the effort or don't take responsibility for their lives uh, benefit at their expense, whether it's bankers behaving badly or, or at the other end of the scale, welfare cheats who don't work and scam the system. You've got to tackle those apparent uh, lacks of, lack of fairness. If you can tackle the lack of fairness, then I think there's no reason that everyone must follow down this path. But do you think what we're seeing is new, or has it always been there, this kind of public attitude, the kind of anger and a sense that the system is rigged, and it's simply that social media has provided the tools for people to express that view? I, I, I certainly think that social media and, as I said, even traditional media who find themselves challenged and needing to cut through and make an impact um, may elevate and amplify, and social media in particular elevate and amplify and express the anger. But uh, So I think they do contribute a lot, but it's not a... I wouldn't want it to be seen as a case of blaming the media. It's more uh, uh, an acceptance of what's going on. But also, there is a feeling for many... Uh, and this was one of the things that I think ultimately was a factor in the Brexit 
uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you looked at the people who voted in the Brexit referendum, who didn't vote in the general election, David Cameron won a general election with 66% of the British people voting a year before the referendum on Brexit. 72% of people voted at the Brexit referendum. Most of that 6% different came from, uh, different in number, came from outside of London in areas where people didn't vote at the general election, were economically um, alienated and, and therefore wanted, they used their vote for Brexit, just as I think many voters in the United States used their vote for Donald Trump, as a device to get attention, to express their frustration that the system that used to work for them didn't seem to be working anymore. But let, let me bring you back, though, to the question of social media. You, you, you know, we, we've, we've talked about this um, before. The, the great promise of social media was that through connectedness, we're going to solve all of mankind's problems, right? It's clear that that's not working particularly well. Um, why has it taken so long to figure out that actually social media has this pernicious and uh, potentially kind of negative impact? Shows the world we're living in when you think 10 years is so long. But uh, <laughs> um, look, I think, I think it's just, you know, it started off very uh, uh, well, slowly but then took great hold. People found it and do find it. You know, I, I'm a grandfather. I live in the United Kingdom. I use Facebook to connect with my children and grandchildren in Australia. It has many uh, elements of, that are very worthwhile. But also with it becomes an, a lack of, I don't want to use the word regulation, but I will, a lack of regulation of behaviour. And one of the few people who tried to do anything about it was David Cameron when he focused on the issue of, of, of pornography, and, pornography and children's access to pornography uh, on social media and was able to do something about it in, in substantial measure, which shows that some of the arguments about, oh, this is, a, yeah. this is something different, you can't control it and you shouldn't, I think um, uh, can be proven not uh, to be somewhat hollow. I think it's just, um, as I said, you know, once we, you know, I think sometimes we have thought bubbles of anger. The trouble with social media is we can take that thought bubble and express it immediately and push it out. Yeah. Uh, and you see the impact on vulnerable teenagers and young girls and in particular from, from the impact, from what happens. But do you think, do you think regulators are going to catch up with social media? I mean, for example, we're seeing regulation in Germany now. We've got Macron's government looking at regulating social media in France. Is it going to come to other countries, to the UK, to the US? I'm sure it will, yes. I'm sure, I'm sure it will because, as I said, 86% of people in the United Kingdom do not think that uh, social media is ultimately good for society. So that's a big, that's a big warning bell. Now, you've got to have responsible uh, regulation uh, or control. And as with these things, you know, reputable and um, responsible organisations can do a lot themselves to ensure that they lift the standards. So let's talk a little bit about political campaigning. You've, you've talked about the need for political leadership um, to address and close some of the, the, these gaps. As a political consultant, what sort of responsibility do you think you have in, in the sense of, or in terms of how you introduce topic areas which are perfectly legitimate topic areas, yet they have the power to create this polarisation effect. So, for example, we've talked about, um, you know, before about immigration. Mm. So how do you introduce the, these topics and what sort of responsibility do po politicians and political strategists have? I think the, the, an issue like immigration is obviously a very, can be a very emotional issue. One of the things that I always try to do, and we always try to do when we run campaigns, is to find out what's truly going on. Why do people hold the views they hold, not just what view do they hold? And when you explore an issue like immigration, you find that actually most people aren't against immigration. It's not, to, not true to say that everybody hates immigration, or, and it's not true, for example, to say that it's all about race. Uh, which some people do, and actually people who do that don't do a service to the debate either. What you find is the thing that people want most of all in relation to immigration, particularly in, in uh, uh, certain countries, um, is a sense of control. They want to know that, that 
and it's about empowerment and sovereignty of a country, they want to know that there's a system they can have confidence in. So some of you may be aware that Australia operates what some people say is a very tough immigration system, that uh, people who try to come to Australia illegally have uh, vessels where they've paid people smugglers um, turned around and they're sent uh, to other locations. But what most people don't know that is, is that per head of population, and in absolute, almost in absolute terms, uh, we take uh, as many as the UK, but in, in, as per head of population, Australians take more immigrants than most other countries of their type in the world. But people have confidence in the system because there's a measure of control. So it's, there are different ways to handle an issue. If you want to whip up a storm to be populist in, all, in order to try to win some short-term votes, then you go down one route. Yeah. If you're genuinely wanting to show to people there's a, a way to address their concerns uh, um, and acknowledge their concerns, you can go down another route. So before we um, uh, go to the audience for questions, one, one other question from me. Question about confidence. Does it get worse before it gets better, or does it get worse before it implodes? What's going to happen? Um, Easy question to yeah, answer. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. I'm, we have a polling business, not a forecasting business. But um, <laughs> uh, look, I think, I think the, real, the question is, are, have, are things changing forever, yeah. or is this just a point in time? Yeah. And I'm pretty optimistic. I think it's a point in time. I think it does come down to leadership, uh, it does come down to ensuring that economic fortune is spread fairly. Um, and it does come down to connecting with the people you seek to represent if you're in a democracy um, and anchoring what you do uh, to the values that they hold dear. Uh, because one of the underlying uh, trends in the Western developed democracies that I mentioned is a sense of lack of fairness, loss of fairness. Fairness can be regained.